the times that um, I've gotten involved in evangelism, some of the times, some of the times, I could sense that there was a spiritual battle. I remember multiple occasions talking to somebody about Jesus and their phone rings at the wrong time. And it's something that gets them mad or off track. That's happened a bunch of times. There was another time when either I was evangelized or about, or about to, and something else very chaotic happened. Um, not that we should be scared of evangelism, but note, note it this way. God wants to save souls. The devil blinds the minds of the unbelieving, right? The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. He wants to keep people away. Think of the parable of the sower. So Satan comes and does what with the word? Snatches what was sown in somebody's heart. Isn't that something? So evil. Praise be to God that he's going to build his church no matter what. Go to John chapter 4. Before we even get to the outline, John chapter 4. Say, why are you going there? Jesus shows us how to talk to somebody about him because that's what he did with the Samaritan woman. Nothing better than learning from the master, amen? No one is better than Jesus. John chapter 4. Now therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although Jesus himself was not baptizing what his disciples were. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee and he had to pass through Samaria. Now you've heard, probably heard messages before and they're true that Jews normally wouldn't go through Samaria. Why? Because Samaritans are half breeds. Half Jew, half Gentile. So even if they had to go a longer distance, they'd go around just to avoid them. Just like people out of prejudice avoid certain areas. Go around it. I don't want to see them, whoever them is. But Jesus is different. He's Jewish according to the flesh. But I think he's got a special witnessing appointment with a Samaritan woman. Don't you think? He left Judea, verse 3, departed into Galilee, he had to pass through Samaria. Verse 5 of John chapter 4. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey. You say, well, Jesus is getting tired? I thought he's Jesus. It's God become a man. He really did become a man. The word became flesh. It's hard to think of God being like us getting tired, needing to eat, sleep. But he did. So there he is. He's tired. Like we are in these hot days. You ever notice you, boy, you really want to just rest after being outside in the heat. Even if you didn't do much. Just come home, turn the AC on, and just, ah. Look at Jesus here. Jesus, therefore, being weary by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, I want to make a, this is a big point here. You and I just need to interact with people. He just, this is a routine kind of a thing. You might go to a supermarket and go to the counter and purchase something and start a conversation with the person there. How are you doing today? And people let you know. And they might say, I'm having a terrible day and there's all kinds of problems. And, and the Lord will give you wisdom for the next things to say. Look at Jesus. He just asked the lady for a drink of water. You might be walking in your neighborhood and comment on how nice their front yard looks. Whatever. Brothers and sisters, interact with people. You don't have to be a genius. 
You don't even have to be the most outgoing person on earth. Just friendly, loving. Anyway, Jesus really is thirsty too. This is a practical thing, right? Look at verse 8. Verse 8 really almost makes me laugh. For his disciples had gone into the, way, into the city to buy food. Doesn't it seem like the, the scripture almost purposely puts it in there to show that they're kind of sidetracked? Jesus is going to witness and they're off, they're worried about food. Now, I might be reading a little bit into the text there, but I wonder if you and I are sidetracked by all kinds of things when we have opportunities to witness and we get sidetracked. I got to go. Have you ever had a time where you're driving and you see somebody on the side of the road that's hurting and, you know, I got to get going, and, but then you turn back. I've had that happen, right? I got, I got to go back. I'm going, and some guy recently had his head down at the bus stop, and I had to at least see what's going on for him. And I'm going like, oh, I got to get going. Oh, no, I don't. I got to talk to him. By the way, pray in the morning that the Lord leads you. We do believe the Holy Spirit, right? He, he guides us. He guides people. I remember I was hearing a John McArthur tape recently, and he talked a lot in the early days of the church. The Spirit led us to this and that, and almost didn't sound like him. But just because we don't believe certain things that people do claim it's the Holy Spirit doesn't mean we don't believe in the Holy Spirit guiding us. Anyway, the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, verse 9, the Samaritan woman therefore said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, this is a big point for me. I love this point. She's surprised that he cares about her or even is interacting with her because usually Jews would pay no mind at all to a Samaritan because they're half breeds. There's a big lesson for us here, people. If you go to people who don't think you're going to go to them, give an example. Well, yeah, I got a bunch of examples, really. One good thing is, if you see, see a lot of times, and since I work with people with disabilities, right? So let's say you're in a Walmart, and a person comes in with somebody in a wheelchair or somebody who's clearly autistic or something. I generally have found that if you say a nice hello, to the autistic kid or the person in the wheelchair, I, they're pleasantly surprised. Because a lot of people, you know how people are, right? People are kind of petty, right? Oh, the person with problems. And... Avoid. That autistic person might be trouble. I found always it's an opening. Hey, good to see you, young man. How are you today? And he says, oh, my name is Ralph. Nice to see you, Ralph. How are you? I'm doing very, you know, usually they're very nice. And then you see a smile on the parent's face. It's a hard life when you have a kid with autism. Trust me. In the studio where I worked, one wonderful Korean family was bringing in a Korean young man. Couldn't talk, couldn't walk right. You got to hold him up. Me on one side, his mother, his father on the other side. Just for him to get a little exercise. And... He would walk on his knees and or just plop to the floor and do nothing. You know how hard that is for a parent? Also, when you cross racial lines. Now, people out in the world, they don't know my, how could, what could I call it? My long history with the black race. <laughs> my prolific history, I want to say. They don't know I'm married to somebody black, right? They don't know that I worked in the Bronx and that, that my other half of my family's black and my kids are half black and everything, right? They don't know. So I have found when I went out of my way to be kind to somebody black, it's like a pleasant surprise to them. And then when I find out about my family, then it's a whole, that's a whole other good thing. But whoever you are, you cross the lines, I know the scripture says in one place, associate with the lowly. Some people look down upon, and it's a terrible thing, isn't it? To say, oh, all those Mexicans take our jobs and our landscape. People look down upon them. It's terrible. But not us. Amen? Not us. 
Because we know everybody's creating the image of God. We know that people are sheep without a shepherd. We know that the Lord calls us to love our neighbor, whoever they are. And when you cross racial lines like Jesus did with a Samaritan woman, it's a good thing. Amen? You tracking with me? They're pleasantly surprised. You ever meet somebody who, and I always ask people where they're from. I try to do it sensitively because I don't want to look like I'm, uh, I'm uh, one of the government workers trying to find out if they're um, citizens or not, right? But let's say I meet somebody who looks like they're from Iran or Afghanistan. A lot of times they don't want to tell you. They're almost ashamed they're from some of those countries. So, oh, where are you from? You have a nice accent. That's one of my big lines. You've got a nice accent. Where are you from? Not where are you from? You might be a stinking Muslim. No, that's not the attitude. Quite the opposite, right? Oh, Afghanistan. Well, what city were you from there? And what's their favorite food? And not, oh, that's one of those bad countries that we had to, you know, have the military go to. It's all how you do it. But for me, people of different nations, backgrounds, races are like a magnet for me. Because I know it's special, you know, I know. And that's what Jesus did here, didn't he? She's surprised. You being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman. And then in, in parentheses, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And there was a time in our country not too, too long ago when many whites and blacks didn't have much to do with each other. Can't lie, right? Segregated neighborhoods, segregated schools, separate water fountains. Jackie Robinson comes into the big leagues and cursing them out. Death threats. Hank Aaron hitting the home runs more than Babe Ruth and threatened his life. By the way, he got 755 home runs. But when you and I show the love of Christ, where sometimes they think that we're not going to show it, Jesus did it. All right, let's move on. You know I like that point. I had a camp on that one. Verse 10 of John chapter 4. Jesus answered and said to him, if you, he said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Li living water? What's he talking about? Now, why is Jesus doing this? Do you see the transition here from regular water to living water? And that's what you and I do. There comes a point, especially when you want to evangelize, in your conversation where you get to the spiritual, you give a little bit of something. You say, how do you do that? Well, you might meet a person, you say hello, and they say, oh, great weather today. Yeah, it is. And man, the Lord brought a great day. <laughs> That's one of my lines. <laughs> and then you get to see. Sometimes they say, praise God. And sometimes they're, you know, turn their head. They go, oh, it's talking about the Lord. At least you start to know kind of, you know, what's going on, a little feeler. So Jesus, living water. Maybe even to pique her interest. I like to tell people, I can tell you how to have all your sins forgiven. Or, or if they ask me, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, and I try to help people understand how they can have all their sins forgiven through Jesus Christ and then live for him. I try to keep it simple and clear. Look what Jesus does, living water. He would give you living water. Now, he gives her food for thought. Verse 11. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Ah, now she's curious. Is this special water that um, makes you young or something like that? Ponce de Leon's, uh, what is that? The Fountain of Life? Right? Wasn't it Ponce de Leon? We're going to pull that out from history. Ponce de Leon, right? He's curious. You are not greater than our father Jacob. He sure was. You are not greater than our, fa our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself, his sons and his cattle. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. But the water that I give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus provided a way for you, my dear, to have eternal life. You might talk, talk about eternal life for people. I mean, we do have good news. 
Eternal life's available. That'll pique somebody's interest. You want to go to heaven forever and ever? I'll tell you how to do it. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. She didn't get it yet. And you're going to meet people that are not going to grasp what you're saying, but, you know, you're being faithful. Eventually she will, though. Now, Jesus, another transition, 16. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. Oh, Jesus, why do you got to talk about sin? <laughs> There's a good witnessing opportunity. He's going to mess. No, he's not going to mess it up. That comes up a lot of times when I'm speaking with someone. If I'm using the evangelism explosion presentation, um, and you get to the point where... Um, you know, you're bringing up verses like uh, man is, you know, about man being sinful and he can't save himself. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life when you get to that. And I talk to them and, you know, or, or even the question, if you were to die today, stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you to heaven, what would you say? And they say, because I was good. Then I know I got to camp on some verses, right, related to sin. Some people are so stubborn in sin, you might have to start bringing up the Ten Commandments, kind of like Ray Comfort would do. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? You've got to get them thinking. Jesus is going to address all the relationships this woman had. So with the rich young ruler, he addressed his what? His love for riches, right? Sell her possessions, give to the poor, come follow me. The Lord will give you wisdom with that. That doesn't mean we hold up a sign and said, repent, you dirty sinners. But that does mean that we're not afraid to bring up the topic of sin. Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. You have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. This you have true, excuse me, said truly. Well, Jesus has special insight. So he brings up the fact that she's been involved with so many different men. So that's why when we get to the grace outline, which we're going to do pretty soon, which is on that chair, each of you will need one at some point this night after we do John 4. Um, the idea of repentance can't be skirted. You know, you are turning from your sin to Jesus. I've met people who um, tell me they're living together with someone. And they seem to be interested in what I'm saying. And then I'm compelled to tell them that, you know, you can have your sins forgiven and living together is, is a sin. I've um, had a certain guy in my office who was trying to transition to be a woman. And I was there with his, uh, his aunt was there too, thanks be to God. And um, I remember saying to him that, just getting into it, that God made male and female at the beginning. And I said, you know, what was on your birth certificate? And, you know, kind of like what parts do you have? You know, at first was talking about Jesus and forgiveness of sins and everything and eventually had to bridge that topic because the person was interested in it for one and needed to know what God thought about that topic. So I knew with that person I had to bring up some things about that. I couldn't just say, all right, just you know, pray this prayer or whatever and you know, let's not worry about whether you're trying to turn into a woman and all that. Well, that is of concern. I know John McGarth always had a story of... Uh, prostitute that he was witnessing to and seemed like she was going to come to Christ and she, he said to her, well, you know, now it's time to get rid of the black book with the men's names. She didn't want to get rid of it. That's not a good sign. That, you know, the Holy Spirit is not working in that case. Anyway, so the Samaritan woman, five husbands. So 19, she's starting to catch on that Jesus is special. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Ah, now, now they're getting into a spiritual conversation. This is good. And when you and I 
talk to people, same kind of thing. It's going to come up. They're going to tell you they go to Catholic Church or whatever, and now it gets into a spiritual conversation, which is good. So she's talking about, you know, Samaritan worship and all of that. I talked with someone today. I was thinking about this, and I, you know, I want to witness to somebody, and lo and behold, somebody came in the pharmacy, and he was friendly, talking about things. And you know what his big thing was? Two things that were stumbling blocks to him. In his business, he's always fair to people and doesn't cheat anybody, which is admirable. I said, well, that's great. But that seemed to be the righteousness he's counting on to get to heaven. You know, and you've got to discern that. The other stumbling block was that he had a brother who went to Vietnam and had all kinds of problems and ended up taking his life. So, you know, big question, why do terrible things happen to people? And I told him the story of Ryle Reese, who got saved, who's a Vietnam vet as well, and got saved. And, but those were stumbling blocks to him. And, you know, I said what I could say from the scripture, and we'll see him again. He comes in the pharmacy, and, you know, he really wasn't, you could tell he wasn't ready for that much more. Cordial, but you could almost tell when it's kind of like, oh, the conversation's kind of petering out, he's got to go, whatever, and... You know, he's not interested that day. Now I go to my prayer closet for him. And it's almost like I'm always trying to find, I'm always trying to go as far as I can with somebody. I talk with uh, a Jewish lady for an hour. That was an interesting conversation. I was telling Model Balliston about it, who is a converted Jew who might come to the church in September. And it's interesting, this lady she was allowing me to say a lot. Because she's one of these that every religion is good and mine is good. The Jewish, she was into the Jewish faith. She respects Christians. And so, you know, and I said, model, if I tell him I believe the Jews have a right to the land, is that good? He said, sure, sure. So I'm talking with this lady, and uh, she says, Judaism is very hard. I said, why? She says, well, we come to the day of Yom Kippur, and we've got to confess our sins. But it's hard to turn away from our sins and change. And then she went into this whole long thing about how she had been estranged from her brother for years until their dad's funeral. And it was interesting because I was thinking, I said, I said to her, wow, what a contrast with Jesus. Because he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the day of atonement is when he died for us and paid for all of our sin. And you know, she was listening, and this is a reformed Jewish lady. And usually, with some people, you don't even get a chance to talk that long. And for some reason, it was going back and forth. And then I said, I, this is a new thing I say to Jews and Muslims, or not, not, not always Hindus, is that I said, is the Jewish faith only for Jews? I mean, I would think that the real faith would be for everybody in the world. I said, do you, do you evangelize? Do you tell others? Oh, not really. I said, yeah, well, I understand that in the Old Testament, the Jews are supposed to live a, a separate life and be a holy people so the Gentiles would look on and see how special they were, and, but they were supposed to be a light to the nations. But it was interesting. They're content with just with whoever's just Jewish and wants to come, comes. But I said, Jesus said to make disciples of all nations. The Christian faith, the gospels for all the world. And I remember looking at a map one time for Hinduism isn't it interesting? Hinduism is only in certain countries, really. So again, even with our Hindu friends, is that only for people in India and where other places and not for everybody else? And so anyway, reason with people. And that's what Jesus is going to do with her. So she brings up spiritual topic, right? Verse 21. Now here it is. She's mentioning some things about her religion, which is wrong has wrong aspects and is wrong, right? So Jesus is going to wisely begin to inform her about the true God and the true faith, right? About worship. He starts at worship. He's kind of piggybacking on what she brought up. So watch Jesus, the master in action. 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem you shall worship the Father. Special time period coming soon. You shall worship, you worship that which you do not know. We worship what we know for salvations from the Jews. 
But now is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. He's given her insight into the, who the Lord is, what the Lord's looking for in people, right? Then he says, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus doesn't even talk directly about himself yet. Listen, the Lord will give you wisdom in a conversation. Just pray in the morning and get in conversations. I don't know what to say about Well, what we, what we go through is going to help you. I mean, knowing scriptures and some other things is helpful. But you know what? If you're saved, you've been in the church how many years? Everybody here who's saved and has been in the church and reading the Bible themselves and or whatever combination is able to witness. Crying out loud. When the Apostle Paul, as soon as he got saved, he was going out witnessing. You say, oh, but he was an educated Jew and all that. Yeah, but once the Holy Spirit came into him, he's ready to witness. At the very least, you could tell your story of how you got saved. Tell the world about him. The woman says, the woman said to him, I know Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When that one comes, he'll declare all, thing, he'll declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, we can't say that. We're not the Messiah. But we explain a lot about Jesus. Everywhere where you see the apostles preaching, it's always a lot of information about Jesus. And so when we go through the grace outline, which we're going to start tonight, they are not into, as we're not into, a minimal gospel. And what I mean is, when you can sit down and really explain and show people verses about who Jesus is, his death on the cross, his resurrection, take the time to do it. Because that's how you have to really receive the real Christ. We could go to a group of kids in a Sunday school and who doesn't want to go to hell? Jesus died for you, loves you. Raise your hand, pray this prayer, we can get them all saved. And a lot of times people want notches in a belt. 50 kids got saved today. Did they really? Did they really? Now, at the same time, the Lord can use one verse to save people. I've read testimonies, and even Brother Lou to some extent, and others. People have gotten, you know, the Lord, his word is powerful. But generally speaking, I needed somebody to explain things to me with the Holy Spirit working, and so did you. We need to take the time with people. That's why on a Sunday, I'd much rather say, if you're interested in trusting Christ, see me or somebody else after the service. Plenty of time to talk about it. I'm not, I'm not totally against say, saying, you know what, if, if you're, you know, your heart is you know, leaning you toward the Lord, call on his name today. You could ask him to forgive you. Put your faith in him. Talk to me afterwards. But I'm still going to say talk to me afterwards. I don't, I'm, never, I'm not at liberty to say, if you pray, if like say, let's say you raise, did you pray to prayer tonight? You raise your hand. You're saved. You're saved. You're saved. I don't know that. And they say, what about the Book of Acts? Where they, well, I mean, there were some special occasions there. The apostles were operating, and the people who got saved, and somehow they knew people got saved, and they were baptized pretty quick. They really were. And that's where some of these other churches that tell us, oh, you gotta, you know, baptism associated with salvation. Well, no. But it was clear they got saved. And it was well known that the first step of obedience was to, you know, obey him in the waters of baptism. So, we need to explain to people. Look at the time Jesus is taking with her. 27, at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I have done. Well, that could be embarrassing for some guys. You think some of the guys were the, the men she was with, maybe? <laughs> who knows? Come see a man who told me all things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? And I like what it says in another translation. Could it be the Messiah? A song that Michael W. Smith sang. Could this be the Messiah, right? She's already, in a sense, she's already telling other people about Jesus. Isn't that something? And she's just a woman who's with a whole bunch of men. Almost like a prostitute. Already telling people about Jesus. By the way, I talked with the two fellas coming on Sunday. These guys, you know what one guy said? He said, 
I'm the Lord's freed man. Remember that when like a, a slave gets saved and it said in the scripture in Corinthians, he's the Lord's freed man. And he said, he said to me that, Corey said, um, we were, being under heroin was so bad. We were enslaved to that. We feel like we're the Lord's freed men. We're slaves to Christ and it's so much easier to be a slave to Christ than a slave to heroin. That's what the guy told me. And he's getting married. And his family is not saved yet, but they're like amazed at what happened to him because he used to do it and he'll, they'll tell you what he used to do. And it's just beautiful, you know, praise be to God. So hopefully that'll whet your appetite. Now get a hold of your outline. If you haven't got one of those papers in the back, grab one and let's get to it. The, um, the first first page that I photocopied for you was the lessons. And, you know, we may take eight weeks, we may take ten. That's not the important thing. We're just starting it tonight, and I, I'm compelled sometimes to give you a, a passage that I'm thinking about before we do some of that. And I want to order the books. I want to make sure I knew how many wanted it, so um, we'll order the book soon, but I photocopied it for now. And it's just good stuff. You know, things out of Grace Church are good. And uh, so you see the lessons there. And again, it's going to help you to have key verses memorized, if you haven't already memorized some of them, some wisdom for how to present the gospel, how to handle objections, children, work in your workplace. So it's just good stuff. So let's get right to it. Um, on your page one, which I believe is the same as mine, uh, they talk at the beginning about how hard evangelism is and you know, whether you feel anxious and fearful and all that kind of a thing, okay? But I like what they say. Go down to paragraph three. Many evangelistic methods and programs try to minimize the amount of gospel truth, hoping to accomplish more and more by doing less and less. And they say, this is not biblical evangelism. Christ commissioned believers to teach all that he commanded. And by definition, the gospel is the entire good news he came to proclaim. No man-made uh, gimmicks or manipulative approaches will move people to repent, really repent. Our responsibility, I like this line, is to glorify God by proclaiming Christ and Christ and Him crucified and leave the results to God. Okay? So, I, I like their approach here. We want to give them a good gospel presentation. Uh, when we did Evangelism Explosion, uh, you learned really a, at least a 20-minute presentation, if not longer, depending upon how much you have in it. And what was great, when I was at the pharmacy today, that fellow that I was telling you about, one of the ladies there who was trained in evangelism explosion was helping me out. It was good. You know, and she said some, she brought up the, the famous questions. Have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you were to die today, that you'd go to heaven? And it was good. The guy was thinking. That's when he told us how good he was, and he, he does a good business, and he's fair to people. And then, you know, we knew what to say after that. So... Think of it this way. You don't have to always do evangelism the same way, but you want to have tools. If you memorize the Romans Road, that's a great tool. Evangelism Explosion, this stuff. All your knowledge of the Bible is helpful. So, let's get right into it. Let's get to page one. Uh, I think it's page two, actually. Look at the top. It says the motivation. Believers are motivated by understanding Christ's command. You got that? Get to the right page. Flip, I think, uh, I think you guys got to flip a couple pages over. It says at the top, the motivation, believers are motivated by understanding Christ's command. Let me get one of those so I can put one up so I know. I photocopied it so I know the book to use it. Got the page exactly correct, too. Did you open it? Turn that over. Oh, yeah, page one. Second page in your, in your, uh, your sheet here. All right. Let's get to the motivation. Why do we do this? Believers are motivated by understanding Christ's command. If we blank, blank, we will blank, blank. Christ says in Matthew 22, 37 and 39, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall not love your neighbors yourself. Before I get into the rest of the outline, 
If we don't evangelize, are we obeying all that Jesus commanded us? No. Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations. They're going to put that in there. Try to get that in your mind that um, meditating on God's word is good, prayer is good, fellowship is good, but you can't leave it out. It's almost like the old navigator's wheel. Evangelism, commanded by the Lord, it's our mission, and you'll hear me say a million times, it energizes you. you say, what do you mean? You know when you have an evangelistic opportunity, there's a lot of joy in that. It, the, you're fielding their questions, it gets you back into the Bible, it gets you praying. It's a good thing. It's right. And we do it, we should do it out of love for the Lord. The blanks there were if we love God, we will obey him, very simply. And then it gets into how we should live. Believers ought to be characterized by sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. It's a love that's selfless and compassionate. Jesus himself laid down his life on behalf of sinners. So it behooves us to really love our neighbors. It's a great way for your evangelism to take root. When it's couched in love, it's, it's more powerful, isn't it? If you've been good to your neighbor, and I've been good to my neighbors, if I have been, it helps. You're interested in them. You've helped them bring in their groceries. You've lent them something. It's all good. You drop down to number one. Love for God always expresses itself in a lifestyle of obedience. So our grace outline here is, is emphasizing a whole lifestyle of obedience. And as I read through these verses, I want you and I to think about where we might be deficient and we need to step it up because we got to let the light shine, right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. Just bottom line. We're good deeds people. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It has so much to do with loving God, loving one another, loving our neighbor, loving the people in our families. Love, 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 love. There's a lot of love. Now, there's a lot of judgment in the Bible. But actually, that's not, we're not necessarily judging unbelievers, are we? Even Jesus didn't come to condemn the unbelievers necessarily. He came to seek and save them. So just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah, we have to talk about sin. Yeah, we have to. But we're not thinking of sinners, oh, you dirty brat. I mean, we are men of like passion who by the grace of God got saved, except by the grace of God, there go I. So we're not looking at them as some dirty rag. But we're loving them. Why did? You ever think about why tax collectors and sinners flock to Jesus? Why did they flock to him? Must have been something about him, something about that man. God's commands are good, by the way. They keep us out of trouble, don't they? Aren't his commands the best? True biblical love for God will evidence itself in patterns of obedience to commands. Churches are filled with people who call themselves Christians that are indifferent to his commands. Um, an obedient life is really the main evidence of salvation. You'll know them by their fruits, right? Faith without works is dead. dead. Now, I like when they say here, his command to evangelize could not be any clearer. Matthew 28, we've heard it a million times. But even though we've heard it so much, we want to employ it in our lives more, don't we? Go therefore make the, and this is, personally we're involved in this as a church, missionaries, that's why I'm always excited when missionaries come the missionaries that we had from Italy in the past, these two guys who are coming Sunday. It's a beautiful thing. Missions, missions, evangelism, missions. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. You know, if we found out that a whole bunch of illegal people came from Peru 
right in Eagle Estates, I'd be happy about it. Oh, why are you happy? Were like, Mission field, people. I'm not worried about whether they're illegal or not at this point. I want to just tell them about Christ. If they're illegal, let's get them saved. The government deals with whether they should be here or not. That's not, I'm not ICE. You know, if the government wants ICE to get them, then whatever the government wants to do. But until then, I want to witness to them and they come to Christ. Can they come to church? Yeah, they can come to church. And the Bible will straighten, the Bible tends to straighten people out pretty good. People don't get all straightened out in one minute either, do they? There may be kids that come in this church and initially they're smoking a whole bunch of pot. You say, oh, they should be smoking pot. And Hey, you know, there's all kinds of debates about pot. But you know what? I found that the Bible does wonders. You know what? You, you'll get more interested in following the Lord and the power of the Spirit than perhaps any substance. Hopefully, right? Even when people got saved, what was the Jerusalem Council? They didn't slap too many things, too hard of things on the Gentiles. They picked out certain things. Keep away from, you know, you know what they say. Keep away from this, keep away from that, keep away, you know. Things strangled and immorality. And they didn't slap everything on those Gentiles. Let them grow. Let them grow. Let them grow. Anyway, these are my hobby horses, sorry. Now, say, well, what if I'm timid? I'm naturally, I'm shy. Well, the Grace Church is kind of tough on you there. There's no exceptions. Look, look, at this, look at this statement. There's no exceptions for timid personalities or spiritual immaturity, nor is there retirement age. I just want to go to Florida and play golf all day. Well, no. Even if you are retired, the Lord can use retired people so wonderfully. You've got more time to do some good things. I was walking around my block, and I met a guy named George. And he's just sitting there, 35 years in supermarkets, I found out. He's sitting like a bump on a log. He ain't doing nothing. His wife goes to work. And he looks bored as all get out every morning, just sitting there out front. So next time I got to get more gospel next time around. Get this guy saved and, you know, use his life for the glory of God instead of just sitting. The name of Christ on display. Whoever you are, the Holy Spirit can energize you to do what you need to do, right? Even if you are shy, it's all right. The Holy Spirit gives what? In the book of Acts, when the Spirit was with them, they spoke the word of God. How? Timidly? Boldly. How many times did that come up? Parousia, all speech in the Greek. It's like, oh, boldness. You can do it. We must be faithful to proclaim the gospel, whether working in a secular environment or only to the un... or, or our... I'm sorry. We must be faithful to proclaim the gospel whether working in a secular environment or are only two unbelievers we lift up from the crib to the high chair. Talking about your kids. Our motivation comes from understanding evangelism as obedience. All right, so we got that in our heads. Evangelism, obey God, evangelize. Obey God, evangelize. Next part, number two at the bottom. Love from God expresses itself in love toward others. Okay, they're, they're, they're bringing this up again and again. By the way, when people come to our church, if they see us loving God, loving one another, and loving them, it's powerful. Whether they come to the car wash, to a church service, the, um, the bonfire night, garage, you know, whatever we do. The lo love is powerful, especially these days. I'm finding that people want to be in conversations. They've been isolated. These are tough days. Take advantage of it because we don't know how long it's going to last. Verses. 1 John 4, 7, they quote, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God. It's a proof of salvation and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. His very nature is love. If you really got saved then His Spirit has been imparted to you, the Holy Spirit says in Romans, He Puts love in your heart. The love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts. That's where that Keith Green got that wonderful song, You Put This Love in My Heart. I like that song. Put this love. That man saved me from too many Beatles and Rolling Stones. Because it was good when I got saved. It was good music. Ephesians says, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. 
He walked in love. He sacrificed for us out of love. So everything's about love. All right, moving right along. Look at the top of the next page. Let's see, I got some different things here. Hope I don't get messed up here. All right, so we go to the next page. Paul makes it very clear from 1 Corinthians 13 that even if you came with the most eloquent and articulated speech, message, you got that, right? Uh, and do not have love, you're compared to an, annoy, uh, an annoying, abrasive, noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. There was a man in our church who had a lot of positions when I first came to the church, and he was involved in the neighborhood, and he was involved in going to banks, post offices, and when he finally was dismissed from our church from all the things he was doing, and it's from his position, the unbelievers were rejoicing. It was kind of like ding dong, the wicked witch is dead kind of thing. And the new guy that went, bless his heart, they really, you know, they really appreciated him. So the guy that was representing our church was obnoxious, they said. I heard the word obnoxious. Should unbelievers ever say we're obnoxious for any right reason? They may say it because we're preaching the gospel. All right, that's persecution. But what if we really are obnoxious and the unbelievers are saying we're obnoxious? You understand what I'm saying? Be careful. Don't, don't do that. Let's not be like that. In, my, um, in, in the book that they give for somebody leading these things, it says, every interaction with unbelievers must be characterized by a gentle, kind, compassionate, meek love. And it mentions 1 Corinthians 13. Would you agree with that? Gentle, kindness. Even if they're Mormons. Although they're false teachers, so don't let them in your house, talk to them on the stoop. The reason I'm thinking of Mormons, I was driving in my neighborhood with my son, and I said, there they are, the starched white shirts and the ties. And it got me thinking again, look at them. They're going out. They don't even have the true gospel, and we're not going out. That's why the last Tuesday of every month, we meet here. If you want to go out, meet here at 6.30 for prayer, 7, and we'll go out at least one day to put it on the charts. There may be another time, but I'm trying to get times where we just do it. When that other guy told me that 50 people from his church were going out witnessing, I was like, all right, we need to do something like that. Have a witnessing night. So at least I got one, once a month is put in there. Maybe that'll increase, but, so if you want to go out and apply what we're learning here on a Tuesday night, we'll just do it. We pray, and there's ideas of where to go. There's a couple different strategies. We pray. And we go and just start doing it. you got to start doing it. Even if we go out and kind of you're scoping around to see how we would do it. we got to, like, you got to do it. It's just like prayer. You can study prayer for a million years. But bottom line, what's got to happen? Eventually, you just got to start getting on your knees and calling out to the Lord. <laughs> right? Yeah. Same thing with evangelism. You just got to do it. Hopefully, this training helps. From a good source. Um... Christ exemplified love for the paralytic, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, the man born blind, right? He had love for these people. Even a rich young ruler, he said he loved them. The guy loves money, but Jesus loved him. Right? So I think we, put, we did that enough there. Um, go to B. If we obey him, we will glorify him. And everything's for his glory then. It's not for us to get notches on our belt. Not for us to brag about how many people we brought to Christ. Right? But we're really, we're obeying him. He deserve, his name deserves to be lifted up. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, he's going to draw men, you know, unto him, right? It just, it's just right. He's good. It's like, you, you've gotten something new and you want to show somebody and we have Jesus. And it's almost like you want to show Jesus off, kind of. This is Jesus. I met the Messiah. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Matthew 5, 16, they quote, let your light shine before men. How shiny are you? How shiny am I? Something to think about, right? Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your... You know, actually, it's tangible works. Show people who we are. 
Do you realize that? He's actually doing something for somebody. He's taking that homeless guy to Burger King and getting him a meal and asking him how he's doing or what happened to him. Man, tell me what happened to you. Man, I'm concerned about you. What happened? We've done that. Haven't you done that? What happened, man? What's going on? I remember when I was by the post office in uh, Medford and there was a lady on the floor and she seemed, she had her belongings. She was all upset and she had a whole story. And it was a sad one. A lot of sad, sad stories. But we got answers, don't we? We got answers for salvation, wisdom from his word for everything else. But we got to let the light shine. Lifting up Jesus. The Lord lifted him up. Therefore God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And look what they have. Look what they darkened. God is glorified as we obediently proclaim the gospel of Christ. While only God can bring a sinner to repentance, we're responsible to make the message clear and understandable. Same thing we're preaching and teaching. The job is to make it clear. We're not to snow nobody. And be careful using words where the unbeliever won't even understand. My friend, I want you to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The guy doesn't know about any of that yet. I want you to be justified in Jesus' name and sanctified and glorified. Slow down and explain to the guy in terms that they can understand. Using verses, right? Explain. Break it down. Break it down to them. We worship God for proclaiming his word with clarity. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Brethren, pray for us that the word of God may, may spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did with you. We should actually pray for evangelistic opportunities and the word of God to spread. Lord, use us. Even as we, you know, we close tonight. Use us this week. Use us when we go out as a team. Bring us to people that are Open to your word. This is really all that counts these days. This is our mission. Sure. The, the th we could do the three E's. Exalt. Edify. Evangelize. That's not one way to think of it. And then this church, how do we say it? We want to know him. Become like him. Make him known. That was a big motto of ours. Kind of like that. There's no, nothing about fellowship in that motto, but you can't put everything in a motto anyway. Well, we do, this, we do these things. We want to do these things. Let's get that next page there. I don't think we'll do the whole outline tonight because I want to save some of it. Maybe the books will come. A lot of people miss tonight. You know, when you do evangelism, the enemy is going to try to slow us up. I can't tell you how many times it's, it's happened. Man, how many times a phone rings or somebody gets a baby starts crying when you're getting good into a witness. Amazing. But God is greater anyway. You don't have to, not something to worry about. So if our motivation is to glorify God through obeying his command to evangelize, it follows that we must proclaim a God-centered message. Right? We're not just saying to people, you can be healthy, wealthy, and wise if you come to Jesus. Right? He could do some of that for people, but that's not the main, that's not the main thing. Sure, the wisdom of his word helps people to be better workers and all of that, and it could lead to raises, but that's not the point, is it? Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So, we're explaining who the Lord is. So the, it says there, what characterizes the God-centered gospel message? The gospel is the good news that, that's the blank there, that God provides for the forgiveness of sins and salvation from eternal punishment through Jesus Christ. The gospel is confrontational. It calls sinners to repentance. It calls unbelievers to turn from their own efforts for salvation and submit to Christ's lordship. Well, what happened when John the Baptist confronted Herod? If we tell people that Jesus is the only way, 
Because a lot of people are saying, oh, the, you know, the religions are good in many ways. I mean, so many people like that too. And we have to kind of narrow it right down to say, wait a second, he's the only one that died for the sin of the world, only one that could have did it. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And you got to get into all that. It's not, you know, it's not the easiest thing. They're going to say, oh, you're, you're, you're narrow-minded. Well, whatever. But that's what he said. And that's who he is. So we have to explain the gospel the way it's presented in the scripture. It calls unbelievers to turn from their own efforts for salvation to submit to Christ's lordship. There has never been, it, this has never been a popular message. Paul, Peter, James, Stephen, and many others were martyred for preaching it, yet there is salvation in no one else, so we continue to proclaim his gospel message. And then they go on to say it focuses on the person and work of Christ. And at the, the last paragraph, sadly many today are proclaiming another gospel. This deceptive message promises to meet felt needs in exchange for a minimalist commitment. Our market-driven culture in order to appeal to the masses, has produced a man-centered message. So we don't want to do that. You got problems, Jesus can solve your problems. That really is true, but that's not the gospel. Now, somebody might come to you first with their problem. I'm having such a problem in my marriage, and, and I might say something like, you know, the Lord can help you with that, but let me tell you, it all starts with you being forgiven of your sin through Jesus Christ. Let's talk about that. That's going to help you because you, you can get forgiven, you can be saved, and then God is able to transform your life. And you can become a better, yeah, you can become a better husband or wife, but you got to have a right relation with the Lord. The, the, the vertical one before the horizontal ones can be better. So let's talk about the vertical one first. Right? So you, you are taking them from where they are. They might bring something up. Some people, they might just say, my father died of coronavirus. You're not going to say to him, hey, don't worry about that. Let me just, that's, you know, uh, you know, more with, you know, weep with those who weep. And then say, you know what? You know, may the Lord give you wisdom, but you know what? Um, I'm really sorry that you went through this tough experience. And I think you're going to need the Lord's help more than ever. Let's talk about that. You know, you got to see where they are. That first day may not be the biggest gospel day right away. They may not, you know, God did this to my, you know, to my father, and I don't know why he did it. And you may have to just kind of comfort and, you know, cool out a little bit. You see, you know, the Lord will give you wisdom. But don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid to approach people with problems. Unless they look like they're going to kill you or something, and there are people running around like that, a... Uh, a lady said she went to Philadelphia. And she was saddened because she said, there's all kinds of people running the streets that look like they're mad. She made it sound like they're running all over the place. And then she saw a bunch of elementary school kids running, stealing something from a restaurant and running out. And she said it looked like Charles Dickens, uh, you know, um, what was that? Oliver Twist. So brothers and sisters, it, it's... People need the Lord. It's, it's bad out there. It's getting worse, really, every day. But that's why we should be out there, not just the guys with the white shirts. I am tired of seeing only the guys with the white shirts or the other ones with the black bags. I don't know what it is about those bags. You're witnesses. Always got a bag, right? Got to get out there. So, this false gospel next page. Oh, wait, no, is it next page? I don't know. Let me see if yours was... So you don't have this, but I have this. All right. This false gospel message has subtly changed the contents and requirements to make it palatable and appealing to unbelievers. This man-centered gospel message may contain some biblical truth, but those biblical truths are distorted, and the error uh, comes when biblical truths are given out of context. So there we are. And I tell you what, what time is it now? Is it 8? 8.03. We're going to stop there. We're going we're to have restraint. We're going to stop on time. And uh, now you have a choice to take these sheets home and look them over or put your name on it and leave it here. If you know you're going to lose it and ain't coming back next week, leave it on the chair over there. 
And put your name on it, just like in school. Put your name on it. You're not going to be marked on it. The quiz will be next week. So what do you think? This is a good thing to be doing? Evangelism, training, we got to, you know, we got to get intentional, folks. We can, otherwise we're speaking into the air. And remember, not next Tuesday, but the last Tuesday of every month, at least we have one set night. Hey, we might enjoy it so much and say, hey, let's do another. I don't know. I don't have all the answers yet, but I'm just trying to kind of get the ball rolling more. And we were meeting, some of you guys were meeting Tuesday nights anyway, so I figured let's use some of those more strategically because we can't multiply nights for married guys with little kids. Hell, <laughs> Lance. <laughs> it's true, right? You can't multiply nights. Oh, come out every night and do it, you know. So we have to be strategic with the nights we have. Does that make sense? I'm trying to... Thank you. Yeah. So we'll close in prayer. We'll close out these things, and obviously we can chat. But let's... Uh, Close in prayer right there. We'll ask Brother James, Jim Hazelton, a fellow Eagle Estates man, lives in our neighborhood, so he and I are concerned about witnessing in this neighborhood. And he's done it. And uh, let's pray. Now we can chat. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts, and you know what's missing in our lives. And keeps us from going out. So I, I need to see for everyone in this room, Lord, that you would reveal to us what it is that's keeping us from going out. Um, give us courage yes. and wisdom. We thank you for Pastor Chris that he wants to bring the word to as many as possible. So we praise your name, and we want us, Lord, that you provide for us above and beyond um, what we think or ask. Give us a good night, safe home, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming out tonight. and.